Hello everyone and welcome back to the Horror Hut. Now, I know a lot of you use these videos to sleep, so before you drift off I thought it would be a fun idea if everyone can leave a comment to let me know where you are listening from in the world. Also like and subscribe if you are enjoying the episodes. Right, let's get comfy and relax and let's begin. I was driving through rural Georgia, rain pouring down so hard I could barely see the road ahead. My windshield wipers were on full speed, but it didn't help much. I was tense, gripping the steering wheel tightly. It had been a long day, and all I wanted was to reach my motel and get some rest. Up ahead, I saw a car on the side of the road, hazard lights flashing. A woman stood next to it, waving her arms frantically. She looked drenched and desperate. I hesitated for a moment, but then I decided to pull over. It didn't feel right to leave her out there in the storm. I rolled down my window a crack. Do you need help? I shouted over the sound of the rain. Yes, please, she called back. My car won't start. Can you give me a ride to the nearest gas station? I nodded and unlocked the passenger door. She climbed in, dripping water all over the seat. I noticed she was shivering, and her clothes were soaked through. I felt a pang of sympathy. Thank you so much, she said, her voice trembling. I've been out there for almost an hour. No problem, I replied, trying to be reassuring. Where's the nearest gas station? Just a few miles down the road, she said. It's not far. I put the car in drive and pulled back onto the road. The rain was relentless, hammering against the roof and windows. We drove in silence for a few minutes, the tension in the car palpable. Suddenly, I noticed movement in my rearview mirror. A dark figure appeared from the shadows, running towards my car. I barely had time to react before the back door was yanked open, and a man climbed in, brandishing a gun. Don't move, he snarled, pointing the weapon at me. My heart pounded in my chest as I stared at him, fear gripping me. Keep driving, the woman ordered, her tone now cold and commanding. Do exactly as we say, and you won't get hurt. I nodded, my hand shaking on the wheel. I felt trapped panic rising as I realized I had fallen into a trap. They had planned this, using the woman as bait. Where do you want me to go? I asked, trying to keep my voice steady. Turn left up ahead, the man instructed. There's a dirt road. Take it. I did as I was told, my mind racing. I had to find a way out of this. The dirt road was muddy and slick making it hard to keep control of the car. We drove for what felt like hours, though it was probably only minutes. Stop here, the woman said abruptly. I brought the car to a halt, my heart pounding. The man kept the gun trained on me as the woman got out, motioning for me to follow. Get out, she commanded. I slowly opened my door and stepped into the rain, the mud sucking at my shoes. They led me to a small clearing, where two more men were waiting by an old, beat-up van. Hand over your keys, the man with the gun ordered. I fumbled in my pocket, pulling them out and tossing them to him. He caught them and handed them to one of the other men. Take his car, he said. We'll deal with him here. Panic surged through me. I knew I had to act fast. As they turned towards the van, I made a split-second decision. I bolted, sprinting into the trees. Shouts erupted behind me, and I heard the sound of footsteps chasing after me. The forest was dense, branches scratching in my face and clothes as I ran. I stumbled over roots and rocks, the rain making everything slippery. My lungs burned, but I didn't dare stop. I could hear them behind me, getting closer. I spotted a large fallen tree up ahead and dove behind it, trying to catch my breath. I listened, my heart pounding in my ears. The footsteps grew louder, then stopped. 
I heard them cursing, their voices angry and frustrated. Spread out, one of them shouted. He can't have gone far. I stayed as still as possible, praying they wouldn't find me. I could hear them moving through the forest, searching. I knew I couldn't stay hidden forever. I needed a plan. I noticed a small creek nearby, its water rushing from the rain. An idea formed in my mind. If I could follow the creek, maybe I could lose them and find my way back to the road. I waited until their voices faded a bit, then carefully crept towards the water. I moved as quietly as I could, the sound of the creek covering my footsteps. The cold water soaked through my shoes, but I didn't care. I just needed to get away. I followed the creek for what felt like an eternity, my senses on high alert for any sign of my pursuers. Finally, I saw a break in the trees up ahead. I picked up the pace, hoping it was the road. As I emerged from the forest, relief washed over me. The road was just a few yards away. I scrambled up the embankment and onto the pavement, looking around frantically. There was no sign of the carjackers. I started running down the road, not sure where I was going, just needing to put as much distance between myself and them as possible. After what felt like hours, I saw headlights approaching. I waved my arms, praying it was someone who could help. The car slowed down and stopped beside me. An older man rolled down the window, concern etched on his face. Are you all right? He asked. Please, I gasped. I need help. I was attacked. Get in, he said, unlocking the door. I'll take you to the nearest police station. I climbed into the car, my body shaking with exhaustion and fear. As we drove away, I couldn't help but look back, half expecting to see the carjackers emerge from the darkness. But the road remained empty. At the police station, I told them everything. They took my statement and assured me they would search for the criminals. I knew it would be difficult to catch them, but I was grateful to be safe. That night, as I lay in a cheap motel room, I couldn't stop thinking about how close I had come to losing everything. The rain still pounded against the window, a reminder of the terrifying encounter I had survived. I was driving through a small town in Oregon on a stormy night, trying to get home. The rain was pouring down, making it hard to see. The road was deserted, and I was exhausted from a long day at work. I just wanted to get home and crawl into bed. I decided to take a shortcut through a desolate road I hadn't used before. It was supposed to save me at least 15 minutes. I knew it wasn't the best idea, given the weather. But I was tired and wanted to get home quickly. As I drove down the dark, empty road, I felt uneasy. The rain was coming down so hard that my wipers could barely keep up. I turned up the radio to distract myself, but it didn't help much. Suddenly, I saw flashing lights in my rearview mirror. It looked like a police car. My heart started to race. I wasn't speeding or doing anything wrong so I couldn't figure out why I was being pulled over. I slowed down and pulled to the side of the road. The car behind me stopped, and a man in a police uniform got out. He walked up to my window, and I rolled it down just a crack. The rain was pouring in, and I could barely see his face. License and registration, please, he said, his voice calm but firm. I fumbled with my purse, trying to find my wallet. My hands were shaking, and I dropped my wallet on the floor. I picked it up and handed him my license and registration. Do you know why I pulled you over? He asked. No, sir, I replied, my voice trembling. I wasn't speeding or anything. He looked at my license and then back at me. Your taillight is out, he said. I need you to step out of the car. I hesitated. Something didn't feel right. 
The man's uniform looked strange, and his car didn't have the usual markings of a police car. But I didn't want to cause any trouble, so I slowly opened my door and stepped out into the rain. He grabbed my arm, his grip tight and painful. Come with me, he said, pulling me towards his car. Wait, what's going on? I asked, panic rising in my chest. I didn't do anything wrong. Just come with me, he repeated, his voice cold and menacing. I tried to pull away, but his grip was too strong. He dragged me to his car and shoved me into the back seat. I felt a surge of fear as he slammed the door shut and got into the driver's seat. Please, let me go, I begged, my voice shaking. I haven't done anything wrong. He ignored me and started driving. The rain was pounding on the roof, and the road was slick and treacherous. I looked around, trying to find a way to escape. The doors were locked, and the windows were too small to crawl through. Where are you taking me? I asked, my voice barely above a whisper. You'll find out soon enough, he replied, his eyes cold and empty. I felt a wave of terror wash over me. I had to do something, but I didn't know what. I looked around the car, searching for anything I could use as a weapon. There was nothing. As we drove deeper into the forest, the road became more and more desolate. The trees loomed overhead, their branches reaching out like twisted fingers. The rain was relentless, pounding on the roof and windows. Finally, he pulled off the road and stopped the car. He got out and opened my door, grabbing my arm and pulling me out into the rain. Please, don't do this, I begged, my voice shaking. Just let me go. He ignored me and dragged me into the forest. The ground was muddy, and I stumbled as he pulled me along. The trees were thick and close together, blocking out the light. I could barely see where I was going. After what felt like an eternity, we reached a small clearing. He shoved me to the ground and stood over me, his eyes cold and calculating. What do you want from me? I asked, my voice trembling. He didn't answer. Instead, he pulled out a knife and held it to my throat. I felt a surge of panic, my heart pounding in my chest. Please, don't do this, I begged, tears streaming down my face. Just let me go. He smiled, a cold, cruel smile. No one's going to find you out here, he said. No one's going to hear you scream. I felt a surge of terror. I had to do something, but I didn't know what. I looked around, searching for anything I could use to defend myself. There was nothing. Suddenly, I remembered the pepper spray in my purse. I reached for it, trying to be as discreet as possible. My hand closed around the small canister, and I pulled it out. Before he could react, I sprayed the pepper spray in his face. He screamed and dropped the knife, clutching at his eyes. I scrambled to my feet and ran, my heart pounding in my chest. I didn't know where I was going, but I didn't care. I just had to get away. The forest was thick and dark, and I stumbled over roots and branches as I ran. The rain was pouring down, making it hard to see. I could hear him behind me, crashing through the underbrush. I ran faster, my lungs burning and my legs aching. I had to get away. Finally, I saw a light in the distance. I ran towards it, hoping it was a house or a road. As I got closer, I realized it was a cabin. I ran up to the door and pounded on it, screaming for help. The door opened, and an older man stood there, looking confused and concerned. What's going on? He asked, his voice calm and reassuring. Please, help me, I gasped. A man is trying to kill me. He looked over my shoulder and saw the man stumbling through the forest, clutching his eyes. Get inside, he said, pulling me into the cabin and locking the door. We called the police, and they arrived a short time later. 
they arrested the man and took him away. I was safe, but I knew I would never forget the terror I felt that night. As I sat in the cabin, wrapped in a blanket and sipping a cup of tea, I felt a wave of relief wash over me. I was safe. I had survived. I was driving through Texas during a heavy rainstorm, the kind where you can barely see the road ahead. I had been on the road for hours and needed to stop for gas. I saw a sign for a gas station a few miles ahead and decided to pull in. The gas station was old and run down, the kind you see in horror movies. There were no other cars around, just my truck. I pulled up to the pump and got out, the rain instantly soaking me. I started filling up the tank and glanced around. The place felt eerie and isolated. Once the tank was full, I went inside to pay. The clerk behind the counter was a middle-aged man with greasy hair and a creepy smile. There was one other customer in the store, a guy in a dirty hoodie standing by the shelves, pretending to look at snacks. I walked up to the counter and handed the clerk a twenty. He stared at me for a moment before taking the bill and opening the register. As he gave me my change, I noticed the guy in the hoodie watching us. There was something off about the whole situation. You traveling far? The clerk asked, his eyes not leaving mine. Yeah, just passing through, I said, trying to sound casual. I could feel the tension in the air. The guy in the hoodie moved closer, pretending to browse the magazines near the counter. I noticed he kept glancing at me and then at the clerk. They exchanged a look that sent a chill down my spine. I thanked the clerk and turned to leave. As I reached the door, I heard the clerk say something to the guy in the hoodie. I didn't catch the words, but the tone was enough to make me hurry. I stepped outside into the pouring rain, my heart pounding. I got back in my truck and locked the doors. As I started the engine, I saw the guy in the hoodie come out of the store and look around, then walk briskly toward my truck. Panic surged through me. I shifted into reverse, but he was already at my window, tapping on the glass. Hey, man. You got a light? He asked, his voice muffled by the rain. I shook my head, trying to keep my fear under control. No, sorry, I said loudly, hoping he'd go away. He didn't. He just stood there, staring at me with an unsettling smile. I shifted into drive and pulled out of the parking lot, my eyes darting to the rearview mirror. He was still standing there, watching me leave. I breathed a sigh of relief as I got back on the highway, but it was short-lived. A few miles down the road, I noticed headlights in my mirror, coming up fast. It was an old pickup, and it was tailgating me. My heart raced as I realized it was the same guy from the gas station. He started flashing his high beams, trying to get me to pull over. I floored the gas pedal, but the rain made it hard to go fast. The road was slick, and my truck skidded a few times. I tried to stay calm and focused, but the fear was overwhelming. The pickup pulled up beside me, and I saw the guy in the hoodie behind the wheel. He was shouting something, but I couldn't hear him over the rain in my own panic. He swerved his truck towards mine, trying to force me off the road. I swerved to avoid him, my truck skidding on the wet pavement. I managed to regain control, but he was relentless. He pulled back and then rammed my truck from the side. The impact sent my truck sliding off the road, and I crashed into a ditch. Dazed, I looked around, trying to get my bearings. The rain was still pouring down, and my truck was stuck in the mud. The pickup pulled up a few yards ahead, and the guy got out, holding a crowbar. I knew I had to act fast. I grabbed my phone and dialed 911, my hands shaking. As the operator answered, I saw the guy approaching my truck. Help, I'm being attacked on Highway 34, near mile marker 23, 
I said quickly. The guy reached my door and started banging on the window with the crowbar. I scrambled to the passenger side and got out, slipping in the mud. I ran towards the trees, hoping to find some cover. He chased after me, shouting threats. My heart was pounding, and I could barely see through the rain. I stumbled over roots and rocks, my clothes soaked and heavy. I knew I had to keep moving, but my body was exhausted. I found a thick cluster of bushes and hid, trying to catch my breath. I could hear him nearby, crashing through the underbrush. I held my breath, praying he wouldn't find me. After what felt like hours, the sounds of pursuit faded. I stayed hidden, too scared to move. Eventually, I heard sirens in the distance. I peeked out and saw the flashing lights of a police car. I stumbled out of the bushes and waved them down. The officers got out and ran towards me, their faces serious and concerned. I told them everything, and they helped me to their car. They found the guy in the hoodie a short distance away, trying to start my truck. They arrested him and took him away. I was safe, but I knew I'd never forget that night. The rain, the fear, the chase, it was all too real. I never took that shortcut again. I learned to trust my instincts, to listen to that voice in my head that tells me when something isn't right. I was lucky to get out alive, and I'll always be grateful for that. I was walking home from my friend's house. It was a quiet night, and the rain was coming down in a steady drizzle. I didn't mind the rain much, but the dark, empty streets felt different this time. The street lights cast long, eerie shadows, and the only sound was the rain tapping on my umbrella. I was halfway home when I noticed a fan. It was moving slowly behind me, too slowly for my comfort. At first, I thought it was just a coincidence. Maybe the driver was lost or looking for an address. But as I walked, the van kept pace with me, keeping its distance but never turning off. I tried to shake off the feeling of unease. I told myself not to overreact. I picked up my pace a bit, hoping the van would just go away. But it didn't. It kept following me, and my heart started to pound. I turned down a side street, hoping to lose it. For a moment, it seemed like I had. The fan didn't immediately follow. But then, just as I started to relax, I saw its headlights again, turning onto the same street. It was closer now, and I could see the driver's silhouette through the rain streak windows. Panic set in. I didn't want to start running and make it obvious that I was scared, but I also didn't want to get any closer to that van. I scanned the street for any signs of life, any open door or light in a window. Everything was dark and silent. I decided to cut through a small park that I knew well. It was risky, but I hoped the van wouldn't be able to follow me there. I darted into the park, my shoes slipping on the wet grass. I could hear the van's engine revving behind me, and then the sound of a door opening. I didn't look back. I ran as fast as I could, my breath coming in short, sharp gasps. The rain was heavier now, making it hard to see, but I kept going. I could hear footsteps behind me, heavy and fast, splashing through the puddles. I reached the other side of the park and burst onto another street. My lungs were burning, and I was soaked to the bone. I looked around frantically, hoping to see someone, anyone who could help. But the street was as empty as the last. The fan had reappeared. It was at the park entrance, and the driver was now out, running towards me. I caught a glimpse of him under the street light. He was tall, wearing a dark hoodie, and his face was hidden in the shadows. But I could see the glint of something in his hand, a knife. Fear took over completely. I ran down the street, my legs feeling like lead. 
I knew I couldn't outrun him forever. I had to find somewhere to hide. I spotted a narrow alley between two houses and dashed into it, hoping he wouldn't see me. I crouched behind a large garbage bin, trying to control my breathing. I could hear his footsteps getting closer. He was searching for me, and I could hear him muttering to himself. I stayed as still as I could, praying he would pass by. But he didn't. He stopped right in front of the alley, his heavy breathing echoing in the narrow space. I held my breath, squeezing my eyes shut. He stood there for what felt like an eternity, and then, finally, he moved on. I waited until I couldn't hear his footsteps anymore. My heart was still racing, and I knew I had to get out of there. I crept out of the alley and back onto the street, looking around cautiously. The van was gone, and so was he. I didn't waste any time. I ran the rest of the way home, not stopping until I was inside with the door locked behind me. I was shaking, drenched, and terrified. I called the police, but by the time they arrived, there was no sign of the van or the man. The officers took my statement and promised to patrol the area, but I knew I wouldn't feel safe walking alone at night again. It was pouring rain, the kind that makes it hard to see even a few feet ahead. I was driving through the middle of nowhere in the Midwest, trying to get home after visiting my folks. The road was empty, not a car in sight, just endless fields on either side. The wipers were working overtime, but visibility was still terrible. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw a figure by the side of the road, drenched and holding out a thumb. A hitchhiker. I never pick up hitchhikers, but something about the storm and the sheer desolation of the place made me stop. The guy looked harmless enough, maybe in his early twenties, with a backpack slung over one shoulder. I rolled down the window a bit and asked him where he was headed. He said he was trying to get to a town about fifty miles down the road. He seemed friendly, grateful even. So, I unlocked the door and let him in. He climbed into the passenger seat, thanking me profusely. We drove in silence for a while, the rain pounding on the roof. He introduced himself as Jake, said he was coming back from visiting his sick mother. I nodded, made small talk about the weather, the storm. He seemed normal, a bit quiet, but nothing out of the ordinary. About twenty minutes into the drive, things started to change. Jake shifted in his seat, looking around nervously. He asked if we could take a detour, said he needed to pick something up from a friend's place. I told him it was late, and I wanted to get home, but he insisted. His voice had a new edge to it, almost demanding. I tried to brush it off, saying I didn't have time for detours. That's when he snapped. His friendly demeanor vanished replaced by a cold, hard look. He reached into his backpack and pulled out a knife, holding it close to his side where I could see it but not easily reach it. You're gonna drive where I tell you, he said, his voice low and threatening. My heart started pounding. This wasn't the friendly guy I had picked up. This was someone dangerous. I nodded, trying to keep calm. All right, where do you need to go? I asked, my voice shaking. He gave me directions, telling me to take a series of turns that led us off the main road and onto a smaller, dirt path. The road was rough, and the rain was making it worse. We drove for what felt like an eternity, the silence in the car heavy and tense. I kept glancing at him, trying to figure out a way out of this. The knife never left his hand, and his eyes were fixed on me making sure I didn't try anything. Finally, we reached a clearing in the woods. There was an old, abandoned barn in the middle of the clearing. He told me to stop the car and get out. I did as he said, my mind racing, trying to come up with a plan. 
The barn looked like it hadn't been used in years, and there was no sign of anyone else around. He got out too, walking around to my side, the knife still in his hand. We're gonna go inside, he said, nodding towards the barn. I had no choice but to follow. The rain was still coming down hard, making everything slippery and cold. Inside the barn, it was dark and smelled of damp and rot. Jake told me to sit down on an old crate while he rummaged through his backpack. I took the chance to look around, hoping for something I could use to defend myself. There was nothing, just old, broken tools and piles of hay. He pulled out some rope from his bag and tossed it to me. Tie your feet, he ordered, pointing the knife at me. My hands were shaking so badly I could barely manage it, but I did as he said. He came over and checked the knots, then tied my hands behind my back. I asked him why he was doing this, trying to keep him talking, hoping to buy some time. He just smiled, a twisted, cold smile that sent chills down my spine. He didn't answer, just paced back and forth, occasionally glancing out the barn door. Minutes felt like hours. I tried to think of a way to escape, but with my hands and feet tied, there wasn't much I could do. The rain was still pounding outside, the storm showing no signs of letting up. Suddenly, he walked over to me and leaned in close, the knife pressed against my throat. We're gonna wait here until morning, he said. And if you try anything, I'll make sure you regret it. His breath was hot against my face, and I could see the madness in his eyes. I nodded, too scared to speak. He backed off, settling down on another crate, keeping the knife in his hand. I sat there, soaked and terrified, trying to figure out how I could get out of this alive. Hours passed, and he eventually dozed off, the knife slipping from his hand. I saw my chance. Slowly, I worked at the knots around my wrists, praying he wouldn't wake up. It took forever, but finally, I managed to free my hands. I looked around, desperate for anything I could use as a weapon. I found a rusty old pitchfork leaning against the wall. Quietly, I grabbed it, my heart pounding in my chest. I inched closer to him, the pitchfork raised, ready to strike. But just as I was about to make my move, he stirred and opened his eyes. He saw the pitchfork and lunged at me, but I was faster. I swung it with all my strength, hitting him in the shoulder. He screamed in pain, dropping the knife. I didn't wait to see what happened next. I ran, my legs barely holding me up out into the rain and towards my car. I fumbled with the keys, finally getting the door open and jumping inside. I started the engine and tore out of there, the headlights barely cutting through the storm. I drove for miles, not daring to look back. Eventually, I found a gas station and called the police. They went to the barn, but by the time they got there, Jake was gone. They never found him, and I never heard anything more about him. I still have nightmares about that night, the rain, and the look in his eyes. I've never picked up another hitchhiker, and I never will. It was late, and the rain was coming down in sheets. I could barely see the road through the windshield. My old car sputtered and stalled, the engine dying with a final, pathetic cough. I tried turning the key, but it was no use. I was stranded in the middle of nowhere in the Pacific Northwest. I checked my phone. No signal. Of course. I sat there for a moment, trying to decide what to do. I couldn't stay in the car all night. I needed help. I noticed a faint light in the distance, barely visible through the trees and rain. It looked like a farmhouse. Grabbing my jacket, I stepped out into the rain. It was cold, and the water soaked through my shoes and clothes in seconds. 
I started walking towards the light, hoping someone there could help me. The walk felt longer than it should have. The mud sucked at my feet, and the rain made it hard to see. Finally, I reached the farmhouse. It was old and a bit run down, but the lights were on. I knocked on the door, shivering. A man opened the door. He was tall and heavy set, with a scruffy beard and a worn flannel shirt. He looked surprised to see me. My car broke down, I said. I need help. Can I use your phone? He stared at me for a moment, then nodded. Come on in. You'll catch your death out there. I stepped inside, grateful for the warmth. The inside of the house was cluttered but cozy. There was a fire burning in the fireplace, and the smell of something cooking filled the air. Sit by the fire, he said. I'll get my wife. She can help you. I sat down, trying to stop shivering. A woman appeared from the kitchen. She was small and thin, with a kind face and gray hair pulled back in a bun. Hello, she said. I'm Martha. This is my husband, Tom. What brings you out here on a night like this? I explained about my car breaking down and asked if I could use their phone. Martha smiled and shook her head. We don't have a phone, she said. But Tom can drive you to town in the morning. It's too dangerous to go out now. I felt a twinge of unease. Something about the situation didn't feel right, but I didn't have much choice. I was stuck here for the night. Thank you, I said. I appreciate it. Tom nodded and offered me some tea. I took it, hoping it would warm me up. The rain pounded against the windows, and the wind howled outside. The storm was getting worse. As we sat there, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was off. Tom kept glancing at me with a strange look in his eyes, and Martha seemed overly friendly. I tried to relax, telling myself I was just being paranoid. They showed me to a small guest room upstairs. It was simple but clean. I thanked them again and closed the door. The bed was old and creaky, but I was too tired to care. I lay down, hoping to get some sleep. A few hours later, I woke up to a noise. It was faint, but it sounded like someone whispering. I listened, heart pounding. The whispers grew louder and I realized they were coming from the other side of the wall. I got out of bed and pressed my ear to the wall. I could hear Tom and Martha talking, but I couldn't make out what they were saying. Something about the tone of their voices made my skin crawl. I heard footsteps coming up the stairs. Panicking, I quickly got back into bed and pretended to be asleep. The door creaked open, and I could feel someone standing there, watching me. After what felt like an eternity, the door closed, and the footsteps retreated. I knew I had to get out of there. Quietly, I got up and dressed. I tiptoed to the door and opened it just enough to peek out. The hallway was empty. I slipped out of the room and headed for the stairs. I made it to the bottom without making a sound. The front door was just a few steps away. I reached for the handle. But before I could open it, a hand grabbed my shoulder. I spun around to see Tom, his face twisted with anger. Where do you think you're going? He hissed. I... I need to leave, I stammered. I don't feel well. You're not going anywhere, he said, tightening his grip on my shoulder. Martha, we have a problem. Martha appeared from the kitchen, a knife in her hand. She smiled, but it was no longer a kind smile. We can't let you leave, she said. Not now. I struggled, trying to break free, but Tom was too strong. He shoved me into a chair and tied my hands behind my back with a rough rope. Martha stood nearby, the knife glinting in the firelight. Please, just let me go, I begged. 
I won't tell anyone. I promise. Tom laughed, a harsh, cruel sound. It's too late for that, he said. You shouldn't have come here. They left me there, tied to the chair, while they went into another room. I could hear them talking, but the words were muffled. My mind raced, trying to come up with a plan. After what felt like hours, they came back. Tom untied me and forced me to stand. You're coming with us, he said. Don't try anything, or you'll regret it. They marched me outside into the rain. The storm was still raging, and the cold wind cut through me like a knife. They led me to a small shed behind the house. Tom opened the door, and they shoved me inside. The shed was dark and smelled of damp earth. I could hear the rain pounding on the roof. Tom lit a lantern, casting a dim light over the room. There were tools and old farming equipment scattered around, but nothing I could use to defend myself. Stay here, Tom said. We'll be back in the morning. They left, locking the door behind them. I was alone in the dark, cold and scared. I had no idea what they planned to do with me, but I knew I had to escape. I spent the next few hours searching the shed for anything that could help me. Finally, I found a small, rusty saw. It wasn't much, but it was better than nothing. I worked at the door, trying to saw through the old wood. It took forever, but eventually, I made a hole big enough to squeeze through. I slipped out into the night, the rain still pouring down. I ran, not caring about the mud and the cold. I just needed to get away. I didn't know where I was going, but I kept running until I saw the faint glow of headlights in the distance. It was a car, coming down the road. I stumbled towards it, waving my arms, hoping they would stop. The car pulled over, and a man got out. Are you okay? he asked, looking concerned. No, I gasped. Please, help me. They're after me. He helped me into the car and drove me to the nearest town. I told the police everything, but when they went to the farmhouse, Tom and Martha were gone. The house was empty, and there was no sign of them. I never found out what they were planning to do with me, and I never saw them again. I was driving through Nevada, late at night, on a highway that seemed to stretch forever. The rain was coming down hard, making it difficult to see. My headlights cut through the darkness, but beyond that, everything was a blur of rain and shadows. I was starting to feel the fatigue set in. My eyes were heavy, and I knew I needed a break soon. As I was contemplating pulling over, I saw a figure on the side of the road, illuminated briefly by my headlights. It looked like a person, hunched over, drenched from the rain. I slowed down and pulled over a little ahead of where I saw the figure. I grabbed my flashlight from the glove compartment and stepped out into the rain. The wind was cold, and the rain was relentless. I walked back toward where I saw the figure, shining my flashlight around. Hey, you okay? I called out. My voice was almost swallowed by the sound of the rain. I saw a movement in the shadows and pointed my flashlight in that direction. There was a man, soaking wet, shivering. He looked up at me, his eyes wide and desperate. Help me, he said, his voice barely above a whisper. He looked like he had been through hell, clothes torn and dirty. Let's get you to my car, I said moving closer. As I reached out to help him, something changed in his eyes. The desperation was still there, but it was mixed with something else. Something that made the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. Before I could react, he lunged at me. The flashlight flew out of my hand, and we both went down in the mud. He was on top of me, his hands around my throat. 
I struggled, trying to push him off, but he was surprisingly strong. The rain was pouring down, making it hard to see or breathe. I managed to get a hand free and punched him in the side of the head. He grunted but didn't let go. I could feel my strength fading as he tightened his grip. I kicked out with my legs, trying to get some leverage. My foot hit something solid, the flashlight. I grabbed it and swung it at his head. He let out a yell and loosened his grip just enough for me to push him off. I scrambled to my feet, gasping for air. He was on the ground, clutching his head. I didn't wait to see if he was going to get up. I ran back to my car, slipping and sliding in the mud. I could hear him getting up behind me, his footsteps splashing through the puddles. I reached my car and yanked the door open, diving inside. I hit the lock button just as he reached the car, slamming his hands against the window. I started the engine, my hands shaking, and threw the car into gear. I could see his face through the window, twisted with rage. He was shouting something, but I couldn't hear him over the rain and the engine. I hit the gas, and the car lurched forward, spraying mud and water behind me. I drove as fast as I could, my heart pounding. I kept checking the rearview mirror, expecting to see him running after me, but the road was empty. I didn't slow down until I saw the lights of a small town up ahead. I pulled into a gas station, parking under the bright lights. My hands were still shaking as I fumbled for my phone and called the police. They arrived quickly, and I told them everything. They took my statement and went to search the area where I had been attacked. I waited at the gas station, sitting in my car, trying to calm down. It felt like hours before the police came back. They said they found signs of a struggle but no sign of a man. They told me I was lucky to be alive. I drove to the nearest motel and checked in, locking the door behind me and pushing a chair against it for good measure. I couldn't sleep. Every time I closed my eyes, I saw his face, felt his hands around my throat. The next day, I continued my journey, but I couldn't shake the feeling of unease. I kept looking over my shoulder, half expecting to see him standing there, watching me. It was a long time before I felt safe again on the open road. I never found out who he was or why he attacked me. The police never caught him. But I'll never forget that night, the rain, and the look in his eyes. It's a reminder that sometimes, the real monsters are the ones who look just like us. It was supposed to be a scenic route, but the storm turned it into a nightmare. The sky was dark, and the rain made it hard to see. My wipers were going full speed, but it didn't help much. I had been driving for hours and was exhausted. The storm showed no signs of letting up, so I decided to find a place to wait it out. I spotted an old, rundown cabin a little ways off the road. It looked abandoned, but at that moment, any shelter was better than staying in the car. I pulled up close to the cabin and ran inside, hoping to escape the rain. The door creaked loudly as I pushed it open. Inside, it was dark and musty, but at least it was dry. I could hear the rain pounding on the roof, but it felt good to be out of the storm. I walked around, trying to get a sense of the place. There were some old, broken down furniture pieces and a fireplace filled with ash. It definitely seemed abandoned. I found a corner to sit in, wrap my arms around myself, and tried to relax. A few minutes later, I heard a noise from another room. My heart skipped a beat. I thought I was alone. I stood up slowly and listened. The noise came again, like someone moving around. Panic set in. I had to get out of there. I moved quietly towards the door, but before I could reach it, a man stepped out from the shadows. 
He was tall, with a rough look about him, and his clothes were dirty and torn. He had a wild look in his eyes. Where do you think you're going? He asked, his voice low and menacing. I... I didn't know anyone was here. I'll leave, I stammered, trying to keep my voice steady. He shook his head. You're not going anywhere. My heart raced as he moved closer. I backed up, trying to keep some distance between us. He reached into his pocket and pulled out a knife. The blade glinted in the dim light. Sit down, he ordered, pointing the knife at me. I did as he said, my mind racing. I needed to think of a way out. He watched me closely, never lowering the knife. He looked desperate, like a cornered animal. Why are you here? he demanded. I was just trying to get out of the rain, I explained, hoping he would believe me. He stared at me for a moment, then nodded. You're not lying, are you? I shook my head. No, I'm not. He seemed to relax a little, but he didn't put the knife away. I'm not going back to prison, he said, more to himself than to me. I realized then that he must be a fugitive. My chances of getting out alive seemed slim, but I had to try to keep him calm. I won't tell anyone you're here. I just want to leave, I said softly. He looked at me, his eyes searching my face. You're not going anywhere until the rain stops. And if you try to run, I'll kill you. I nodded, trying to hide my fear. I had to stay calm and think of a way out. The hours passed slowly. He paced around the cabin, always keeping an eye on me. The rain continued to pour outside, and the storm showed no signs of letting up. As night fell, he seemed to grow more agitated. He kept muttering to himself, and I could see the strain in his eyes. I needed to take advantage of his distraction. He finally sat down still holding the knife, but his grip was looser. I waited for a moment when he seemed particularly lost in thought, then made my move. I grabbed a heavy piece of wood from the floor and swung it at his head with all my strength. He went down, dropping the knife. I didn't wait to see if he was out cold. I grabbed the knife and ran out of the cabin, into the pouring rain. The darkness and rain made it hard to see but I ran as fast as I could, fueled by fear. I stumbled through the mud and water, not sure where I was going. I just needed to put as much distance between us as possible. Eventually, I found the road and followed it until I saw headlights in the distance. I waved my arms frantically, hoping it was someone who could help. The car stopped, and the driver rolled down the window. Are you okay? he asked concern in his voice. I nodded, out of breath. There's a man in the cabin, he's dangerous. Please, call the police. He nodded and let me into the car, handing me his phone. I called 911 and told them everything. They assured me that help was on the way. We waited in the car until the police arrived. They found the man in the cabin, unconscious but alive. They took him into custody, and I was finally able to breathe a sigh of relief. The police took my statement and made sure I was okay before letting me go. I continued my journey, but the memory of that night stayed with me. The rain, the fear, and the desperation in that man's eyes haunted my dreams for a long time. I was lucky to get out alive, but I'll never forget how close I came to losing everything in that old, abandoned cabin in the middle of nowhere. The storm hit suddenly as I drove through the winding roads of the Appalachian Mountains. The rain came down hard, making it difficult to see even a few feet ahead. My old car struggled up the hills, and just as I reached a particularly steep incline, it sputtered and died. I tried the ignition again and again, 
but it was no use. I was stranded. I had no cell service, and the nearest town was miles away. I decided to leave the car and hike to find help. I grabbed my flashlight and raincoat, locked the car, and started walking. The rain soaked me through almost instantly, and the wind held around me, making it hard to keep my footing on the slippery road. After what felt like hours of trudging through the storm, I saw a light in the distance. As I got closer, I realized it was a house, a small, old-looking cabin nestled among the trees. I felt a surge of relief. I reached the front porch and knocked on the door, hoping someone would hear me over the storm. A moment later, the door creaked open, and an older man with a kind face peered out. He looked surprised to see me but quickly ushered me inside. The warmth hit me like a wave, and I realized how cold I was. The man introduced himself as Tom, and his wife, Margaret, came out from the kitchen, offering me a towel and some dry clothes. They were incredibly hospitable, making me a cup of hot tea and sitting me down by the fire. I explained what had happened, and they nodded sympathetically. Tom told me I could stay the night and that he would help me with my car in the morning when the storm had passed. Their kindness put me at ease, and I started to relax. But as the evening wore on, I began to notice little things that made me uneasy. Tom and Margaret exchanged strange looks when they thought I wasn't watching. There were odd noises from the basement, and at one point, I could have sworn I heard a muffled cry. I tried to brush it off as my imagination running wild, but the feeling of unease grew. After dinner, Tom showed me to a small guest room. It was cozy, with a single bed and a window that looked out into the dark woods. He told me to make myself comfortable and that they would see me in the morning. I lay in bed, listening to the rain hammering against the window. Despite my exhaustion, sleep wouldn't come. My mind kept returning to the strange noises and the uneasy feeling I had. Finally, I decided to get up and explore a bit. Maybe I could figure out what was bothering me. I slipped out of bed and crept down the hallway. The house was silent except for the ticking of a clock and the distant rumble of thunder. I found the door to the basement slightly ajar, and with a deep breath, I pushed it open. The stairs creaked as I descended, and the air grew colder. The basement was dimly lit, and it took a moment for my eyes to adjust. As I reached the bottom, I saw something that made my blood run cold. There, chained to the wall, was a young woman. She looked up at me with wide, terrified eyes. Before I could react, a hand clamped down on my shoulder. I spun around to see Tom standing there, a cruel smile on his face. He had a gun pointed at me. You should have stayed in bed, he said quietly. Margaret appeared beside him, holding a length of rope. They forced me into a chair and tied me up. My mind raced, trying to think of a way out. The woman on the wall whimpered, and Tom shot her a warning look. You weren't supposed to find her, Margaret said, her voice cold. We have our secrets, and now you're part of them. They left me there, tied up and helpless. I struggled against the ropes, but they were too tight. Hours passed, and the storm raged on outside. I could hear Tom and Margaret talking in the next room, their voices muffled. I knew I had to get out before they decided to silence me for good. I worked the ropes against the sharp edge of the chair, slowly fraying them. My wrists bled, but I didn't stop. Finally, after what felt like an eternity, the rope snapped. I was free. I crept over to the woman and freed her from her chains. She was weak but managed to stand. We moved quietly up the stairs, praying Tom and Margaret wouldn't hear us. As we reached the main floor, the front door suddenly swung open, and a figure stood silhouetted against the rain. It was a local police officer, responding to a report of a stranded car. He looked as shocked to see us as we were to see him. Before Tom or Margaret could react, the officer drew his gun and ordered them to the ground. Backup arrived shortly after, 
and they took Tom and Margaret away. The woman and I were taken to the hospital, where we were treated for our injuries. It turned out that Tom and Margaret had been kidnapping travelers for years, keeping them locked away in their basement. I was lucky to escape with my life. The storm had saved me in a way, leading the police to the cabin at just the right moment. I never went back to that part of the mountains again. The memory of that night haunted me, but I was grateful to be alive. The experience changed me, making me wary of trusting strangers. The kindness of the couple had been a mask for their dark secrets, and I would never forget the terror I felt in that old, creaking cabin. I was driving through New Orleans on a dark, rainy night, trying to find my hotel. The rain was coming down hard, making it difficult to see the road. My GPS kept losing signal, and I realized I was completely lost. I turned down a narrow street, hoping to find a way back to a main road, but it only led me deeper into a maze of unfamiliar streets. I could feel the unease growing inside me. The buildings were old and run down and there were no other cars or people around. Just when I was about to turn back, my car suddenly sputtered and died. I tried the ignition, but it wouldn't start. I was stranded in the worst possible place. As I sat there, wondering what to do, I saw a figure approaching. A man, tall and thin, with a hood pulled up against the rain. He knocked on my window, and I hesitated before rolling it down just to crack. Need some help, he asked, his voice rough but not unfriendly. Yeah, I said, trying to keep my voice steady. My car broke down, and I'm lost. He nodded. I know a good mechanic nearby. I can take you there if you want. I didn't have many options, so I agreed. I grabbed my purse and got out of the car, locking it behind me. He led me down a few streets, the rain soaking us both. I tried to memorize the route, but everything looked the same in the dark and rain. After a few minutes, he turned down an alley. I hesitated, looking back the way we came. Are you sure this is the right way? Trust me, he said, his tone a bit sharper now. It's just around the corner. Something in his voice made me uneasy. I followed him. The alley was narrow and dark, and my heart started to race. Suddenly, he stopped and turned to face me. His expression had changed, the friendly facade replaced by something much darker. You should have stayed in your car, he said, stepping closer. Before I could react, he grabbed my arm and pulled me deeper into the alley. I struggled, but he was much stronger than me. Panic set in and I screamed for help, but the rain drowned out my cries. He dragged me to a door at the end of the alley and shoved me inside. The room was dimly lit and smelled of damp and decay. There were two other men inside, both looking at me with predatory eyes. My captor pushed me into a chair and tied my hands behind my back. You're gonna regret coming here, he said, his breath hot against my face. The other men laughed and I felt a wave of despair wash over me. I tried to stay calm and think of a way out. They hadn't taken my purse, and I remembered I had a small pocket knife inside. As they talked among themselves, I slowly worked my hands to reach the knife. My fingers found it, and I started sawing at the ropes. The men didn't notice, too busy discussing what to do with me. They seemed to be waiting for someone. My heart pounded in my chest, and I tried to stay focused. Finally, the ropes gave way, and I was free. I didn't waste a second. I jumped up and bolted for the door, knocking one of the men aside. I ran back into the alley, slipping on the wet ground. I could hear them shouting behind me, but I didn't look back. I ran as fast as I could, my only thought to get away. 
I reached the main street and kept running until I saw a police car. I flagged it down, sobbing and out of breath. The officer got out and took me to safety. I told him everything, and then went to search for the men, but by the time they got there, the place was empty. I was taken to the station, where I gave a full statement. They found my car and towed it to a mechanic. The officer told me I was lucky to be alive. The area I had wandered into was known for crime, and many people didn't make it out once they were caught. I eventually made it to my hotel, but I couldn't sleep that night. The events replayed in my mind over and over. I had been so close to something terrible, and it was only by a stroke of luck that I escaped. The memory of that night still haunts me, a reminder of how quickly things can go wrong. I never drove through New Orleans again, and I learned to trust my instincts. I was driving through the New Mexico desert on a rainy night. The rain was heavy, and the windshield wipers were working overtime. The road was almost invisible, just a long, dark stretch with no other cars in sight. I was on my way to visit an old friend, trying to make up for lost time. The loneliness of the drive was getting to me, but I pushed on, determined to get there before midnight. After a while, I saw headlights ahead flickering through the downpour. As I got closer, I noticed a car pulled over to the side of the road, hazard lights blinking. A couple of figures were standing near the car, waving their arms. It looked like an accident, so I decided to stop and see if they needed help. I pulled over and got out, the rain instantly soaking me. As I approached, one of the figures, a woman, ran towards me, her face pale and eyes white with fear. Thank you for stopping, she said, her voice shaking. We had an accident, and my husband is hurt. I glanced at the car. It was dented and the hood was popped open. The other figure, a man, was slumped against the car, holding his side. I felt a pang of concern and walked closer. Do you need a ride to the nearest town? I asked. Yes. Please, she replied, but we need to get my husband out of the car first. I nodded and walked over to the man. As I bent down to help him, I heard a noise behind me. Before I could turn, something hard hit the back of my head, and I fell to the ground, dazed. My vision blurred, and I felt hands grabbing me, dragging me away from my car. I tried to fight back, but my limbs felt heavy and unresponsive. They pulled me towards their car, shoving me into the back seat. My head was spinning, and I could barely make out their faces through the rain and darkness. The woman got into the driver's seat, and the man sat beside me, holding a gun. Stay quiet, and you won't get hurt, he growled, his voice low and threatening. I nodded, too scared to speak. The car started moving, and I realized I was in serious trouble. My mind raced, trying to figure out what they wanted. Were they robbers? Kidnappers? I had no idea, but I knew I needed to stay calm and think of a way out. We drove for what felt like hours, the rain pounding against the car. I watched the landscape change from flat desert to rocky hills. There were no other cars, no signs of civilization. Just endless darkness and rain. I tried to keep track of the turns we took, but my head was still throbbing from the blow. Eventually, the car stopped. They pulled me out, and I saw we were in front of an old, abandoned building. They dragged me inside, the musty smell hitting me instantly. The place was falling apart, with broken windows and graffiti-covered walls. They pushed me into a small room and tied me to a chair. The man stood in front of me his eyes cold and hard. We need your car, he said. You're gonna tell us the code for the GPS tracker, and then we'll let you go. I shook my head, confused. I don't have a GPS tracker, I said. 
I swear. He scowled and hit me across the face. Don't lie to me. We know you have one. I tasted blood in my mouth and realized they had made a mistake. My car didn't have a tracker, but they wouldn't believe me. I had to find a way to convince them or escape before they decided to kill me. I'm telling the truth, I insisted. I'm just passing through. My friend lives in Santa Fe. Please, you have to believe me. The woman walked over, her expression softer than the man's. Maybe he's telling the truth, she said. We should check the car. The man nodded reluctantly and left the room. The woman stayed behind, watching me closely. I took a deep breath and tried to think. My hands were tied, but my legs were free. If I could just distract her for a moment, I might have a chance to escape. Look, I don't want any trouble, I said, trying to sound calm. Just let me go, and I won't say anything to the police. She shook her head. We can't take that risk. I heard footsteps outside, and the man returned, looking frustrated. The car doesn't have a tracker, he said. He's telling the truth. I felt a small surge of hope. Maybe they would let me go now. But the man's next words crushed that hope. We can't leave any witnesses, he said, pulling out his gun. We'll take his car and ditch him here. Panic set in, and I knew I had to act fast. As the woman turned to talk to the man, I kicked out with my legs, hitting her in the knee. She screamed and fell, and I used the distraction to get to my feet still tied to the chair. The man aimed the gun at me, but I swung the chair around, hitting him with the back of it. He stumbled, and the gun went off, the sound deafening in the small room. I didn't wait to see if he was hit. I ran out the door, the chair still tied to me. I heard them shouting behind me, but I didn't stop. I ran through the building, looking for an exit. I found a broken window and threw myself through it, landing hard on the ground outside. The rain was still pouring, making it hard to see, but I didn't care. I just needed to get away. I struggled to my feet and ran towards the road, the chair slowing me down. I could hear them behind me, getting closer. My lungs burned, and my legs felt like lead, but I kept going. I saw headlights in the distance and waved frantically, hoping it was a passing car. The vehicle slowed down and stopped. I ran to it, banging on the window. Help me, please. I shouted. They're trying to kill me. The driver, an older man, looked shocked but opened the door. Get in, he said. I climbed in, and he sped off just as my pursuers reached the road. I watched them disappear in the rearview mirror, feeling a wave of relief wash over me. The driver took me to the nearest police station, where I told them everything. They found my car in the abandoned building, but the couple was gone. The police assured me they would keep looking, but I knew it would be a long time before I felt safe again. I was driving through the mountains of Colorado when the storm hit. The sky turned dark and rain started pouring down in heavy sheets. I could barely see the road in front of me. I had a GPS, but it kept losing signal. I needed to get to my cabin before nightfall, so I decided to take a shortcut I saw on the map. The shortcut was a narrow, winding road that seemed to go on forever. The rain made it slippery and dangerous but I pushed on, hoping it would save me time. The trees on either side were thick and tall, blocking out what little light was left. It felt like I was driving into a tunnel of darkness. Suddenly, my car hit something, and I skidded to a stop. I got out to check and saw a fallen tree blocking the road. The rain was relentless, and I was drenched within seconds. 
There was no way around it, and I couldn't move the tree by myself. I was stranded. I decided to wait out the storm in the car, hoping someone would come by. I got back in, locked the doors, and tried to calm down. Hours passed, and the storm showed no sign of letting up. My phone had no signal, and the battery was running low. I felt completely isolated. As night fell, the rain finally started to ease. The darkness outside was complete, and the only light came from my car's interior. I was about to try and get some sleep when I saw movement outside. My heart skipped a beat. Someone was out there, watching me. I strained to see through the rain-streaked windows but could only make out a vague shape. It seemed to be moving closer. Panic set in, and I started the car, hoping to at least turn on the headlights to see better. The car wouldn't start. The battery was dead. The figure outside moved closer, and I could see it was a man. He was tall and wearing a dark coat, his face hidden in the shadows. He stopped a few feet from the car and just stood there, staring at me. I felt a chill run down my spine. I didn't know what he wanted, but I knew it wasn't good. I fumbled for my phone, hoping to use the flashlight as a weapon if needed. The man started tapping on the window, slowly at first, then harder. The sound was unnerving in the silence. I tried to shout at him to go away, but my voice was shaky and weak. He leaned closer to the window, and I could see his face. It was pale and twisted into a malicious grin. He mouthed something, but I couldn't make it out. I locked eyes with him, my mind racing with fear. I had to get out of there. I grabbed the door handle on the passenger side and threw it open, running into the dark forest. The rain had turned to a light drizzle, but the ground was muddy and difficult to navigate. I could hear him behind me, his footsteps heavy and determined. I ran as fast as I could, my breath coming in ragged gasps. The trees were thick, and I kept tripping over roots and branches. I didn't know where I was going, but I couldn't stop. I glanced back and saw his silhouette moving quickly, getting closer. I stumbled into a clearing and saw a small cabin in the distance. It was dark, but it was my only hope. I sprinted towards it, praying the door would be open. I reached it and turned the handle. It was unlocked. I rushed inside and slammed the door shut, locking it behind me. The cabin was old and dusty, with minimal furniture. I found a chair and wedged it under the doorknob, hoping it would hold. I tried to catch my breath, listening for any sign of a man. The only sound was the rain and my own heartbeat pounding in my ears. Minutes passed, then an hour. I started to relax, thinking maybe I had lost him. But then I heard it. The slow, deliberate sound of footsteps on the porch. He had found me. My heart raced again, and I looked around for something to defend myself with. There was an old fireplace poker in the corner. I grabbed it and stood ready. The doorknob rattled, and the door creaked as he pushed against it. The chair held, but I knew it wouldn't for long. He started pounding on the door, the wood splintering under the force. I backed away, holding the poker tightly, my hands shaking. The door burst open, and he stepped inside, his eyes locking onto mine. He didn't say a word, just smiled that same twisted smile. I swung the poker, but he caught it, wrenching it from my hands. He threw it aside and advanced on me. I backed into a corner, trapped. He reached out, and I closed my eyes, expecting the worst. Suddenly, I heard a shout from outside. The man turned, and I saw headlights through the broken door. Another car had pulled up, and someone was yelling. The man hesitated then turned and ran out the back of the cabin. I stayed frozen in place until a man and woman entered, their flashlights sweeping the room. They saw me and rushed over, asking if I was okay. I could barely speak, just nodded. 
They called the police, and I finally felt a sense of relief wash over me. The authorities arrived and took my statement, but the man was long gone. They promised to search the area, but I knew he was already far away. I never found out who he was or why he was out there. I just knew I was lucky to be alive. That night changed me forever. I never take shortcuts, and I always made sure my car is in perfect condition before any trip. The memory of his twisted smile still haunts me, but I know I'll never let my guard down again. I was driving through a small town in Kansas one rainy night. The rain was coming down hard, making it difficult to see the road. I had been driving for hours and needed a break. I saw a small diner up ahead, its neon sign flickering in the rain. I decided to stop and get some coffee, maybe a bite to eat. I parked my car and ran inside, trying to avoid getting too wet. The diner was almost empty just a few people sitting at the counter and a couple in a booth. The waitress, a tired-looking woman in her fifties, gave me a strange look as I walked in. I shrugged it off and found a seat at the counter. I ordered a coffee and a slice of pie. The waitress brought it over, still giving me that odd look. I tried to ignore it and focused on my food. The coffee was strong, and the pie was decent. I was just glad to be out of the rain for a while. As I ate, I noticed the other patrons were acting strangely. The couple in the booth kept glancing at me, whispering to each other. The two men at the counter were doing the same. I started to feel uneasy, but I told myself it was just my imagination. After a few minutes, the door to the diner opened, and a man walked in. He was tall and muscular with a shaved head and a scar across his cheek. He scanned the room, his eyes lingering on me for a moment before he took a seat at the counter. The waitress seemed nervous as she took his order. The man ordered a coffee and sat there, staring at me. I tried to focus on my pie, but I could feel his eyes on me. The couple in the booth got up and left, glancing back at me as they went. The two men at the counter started talking quietly their voices too low for me to hear. I finished my pie and sipped my coffee, trying to decide what to do. I didn't want to leave the diner, but I couldn't stay there all night. The rain was still coming down hard, and I had a long drive ahead of me. The tall man got up and walked over to my side of the counter. He stood there for a moment, then sat down on the stool next to me. I could feel his presence, and it made my skin crawl. Where are you headed? He asked, his voice low and rough. Just passing through, I replied, trying to keep my voice steady. Long way from home, huh? He said, his eyes narrowing. Yeah, I said, not wanting to give him any more information. He nodded and looked around the diner. The two men at the counter were watching us, and the waitress was nowhere to be seen. I felt a knot of fear in my stomach. Something was wrong, and I needed to get out of there. I finished my coffee and stood up, reaching for my wallet. The tall man grabbed my arm, his grip strong and painful. Leaving so soon, he asked, his voice menacing. Yeah, I need to get back on the road, I said, trying to pull my arm free. He tightened his grip and leaned closer. Not so fast. We need to have a little chat first. I glanced around the diner, looking for help, but the other patrons were just watching, doing nothing. The waitress was still missing, and I felt a surge of panic. Let go of me, I said, trying to sound confident. The man just laughed and pulled me towards the door. The two men at the counter stood up and followed us. I struggled, but his grip was too strong. We stepped outside into the rain, and he shoved me against the wall. The other two men stood nearby, watching. I could see my car, 
just a few feet away, but I knew I wouldn't make it. You're gonna give us everything you got, the tall man said, his face inches from mine. And if you try anything stupid, you'll regret it. I nodded, my heart pounding. I reached into my pocket and pulled out my wallet, handing it over. He snatched it from me and opened it, rifling through the contents. He took my cash and tossed the wallet to the ground. Keys, he demanded, holding out his hand. I hesitated for a moment, then handed over my car keys. He smiled, a cruel grin that sent chills down my spine. Good boy, he said, patting my cheek. Now get lost. He shoved me towards the edge of the parking lot, and I stumbled in the rain, trying to keep my balance. I looked back and saw the three men getting into my car. The engine roared to life, and they sped off, leaving me standing there, soaked and terrified. I had no choice but to start walking. The rain was relentless, and I was soaked to the bone within minutes. I kept glancing over my shoulder, afraid they might come back. The town was small, and there were no other cars on the road. After what felt like hours, I saw the lights of a gas station up ahead. I hurried towards it, desperate for help. The attendant looked up as I walked in, his eyes widening at the sight of me. Can I help you? He asked, his voice cautious. I need to use your phone, I said, my voice shaking. I was robbed. He nodded and handed me the phone. I called the police and reported what happened. They arrived a short time later and took my statement. The officers were sympathetic, but I could tell they didn't expect to catch the men who robbed me. They gave me a ride to a nearby motel, where I spent the night, unable to sleep. The events of the evening played over and over in my mind. I was angry at myself for stopping at that diner for not trusting my instincts. The next day, I arranged for a friend to pick me up. I left that town behind, but the fear stayed with me. I'll never forget the look in that man's eyes, the feeling of helplessness as he took everything from me.